Um, I'd like to begin today by, by thanking my old friend Jim Wetzel of the Augustinian Institute uh, and my new friend uh, Daniel Cheeley of the Collegium Illust Institute for working together to make these two sessions possible. Zoom is in many ways a diabolic creation and I'd so hoped to be present in person for these events. And yet even the diabolic may be turned to good use on occasion. Proceeding with these seminars over Zoom has enabled many to be present who would otherwise be absent. And for that, I am grateful. Allow me to begin with a sentence or two about the origin of these seminars. Alongside my work in early Christian theology, I've also wasted a good deal of time thinking and occasionally publishing about the character of theological thinking itself. And as Jim told you, I find myself at the moment heading towards a book on the topic. And yet perhaps ironically, writing a book on the topic now seems possible to me, not because I have a system clear, but because I recognize in a way that I did not even 10 years ago, that I cannot offer a system. It seems far too silly an exercise in the face of the challenges and constraints that theologians face. Any systematic account of how different theological disciplines interrelate will be of little practical usefulness if it does not also reflect on the sheer force with which the modern university has forced on us all disciplinary subdivisions and distinctions, as well as theoretical concerns that need searching examination. The best task we can perform then is one that combines strategic and tactical reflection. The problematic situation in which we find ourselves needs to be conceived every bit as much as solutions need to be offered. I might as well also own up to the fact that thinking about these matters at 55 is a rather different enterprise than it was at 35. But it is not, I hope, that I have just become exhausted at the yearly grind of committee meetings and teaching and exhausted at the inability of departments to decide on curricula and hiring decisions in a rational manner. It is that once one has seen the wheel reinvented and then the invention ignored a good few times, one realizes just how difficult it is to effect change and with what skill fallen human nature is able to undermine and evade the good that it could do. But a sense of resignation may also be a good stimulus for thought. An open recognition of the forces that shape so much of our lives as thinkers can, I hope, stimulate a useful strand of reflection on what is needful at this moment. I'm not, however, so naive as to think that offering a general diagnosis of a problem and suggestions about what should be different will really affect any real change. The institutional forces in play, every bit as much as intellectual trends, are not easily resisted. But affecting a tiny shift in the imagination of some is not a bad goal, and I hope worth the effort. Now, in what I have to say today and tomorrow, I will not be able to cover all the ground that I set out in the short descriptions that I wrote in advance, but that is for me almost always the case. In particular, I will have only a little to say about the status of scripture. Now I'm not too worried about this, simply because Jim and Dan have organized these sessions such that we have plenty of time for actual discussion, so we should be able to get to most of the things that I said I would discuss, but actually didn't. And so let's get to the point. My first task is to be clear about the nature of theology. In fact, as will become increasingly clear, I want to begin here not simply out of a concern for terminological exactitude, but because an awful lot of what I want to say flows from understanding the nature of theology in a certain way. A couple of years ago, in the Oxford Handbook of Catholic Theology, which Jim kindly mentioned, I offered a definition of theology, some of which I would like to quote here. Quote, Theological thinking is one way in which Christians proclaim, speculate, wonder, and praise. Christians think theologically about the meaning of God's action in Christ, the nature of the God who has acted, the character of appropriate human intellectual and moral life in the light of this divine action, 
how the created order should be envisaged in the light of its relationship to its creator and savior. The primary focus of theological reflection is the mystery of God and God's action. But because theological thinking struggles to see how all things are illuminated by the light of faith and how human reasoning may flourish through the organizing and gathering that faith, faith calls us to, theological thinking finds itself engaging and learning from conversation partners across many fields of human experience and many fields of intellectual exploration. Theology should also be constantly attentive to the church's tradition, believing that through the work of Christ and the spirit, God leads the church into knowledge of the divine economy and mystery. Indeed, theological thinking itself has been brought into being by God's action and to further the work of gathering the saved into the harmonious community of Christ's body. Thus, theology is a human activity yet one founded in and ultimately dependent upon the work of Son and Spirit, in a way parallel to the performance of the Christian virtues that are both ours and yet gifts from God. Just as Christians find themselves inevitably living with both darkness and illumination in their spiritual lives, so theological thinking involves an intrinsic darkness as well as certainty, because through this thinking, we advance towards one who reveals himself as transcendent, mysterious, and glorious beyond our comprehension. I think we can expand a little on this brief description by suggesting that theology may be considered under two basic headings, those of handing on, traditio, and speculating, speculatio. The task of handing on that which we have been given handing on so that its promise is embraced by a new generation, is one of the most basic movements of the theological act. That which we hand on involves not only propositions, statements of faith, and a symbolic universe, but also a sense of the promise and tensions that flow from the complexities of our relationship to the incarnate word. Handing on, traditio, is also a prophetic but I understand the term prophetic in a fairly traditional Christian sense, not as the prophesying of what will happen, but as a testifying to the work of God. Testimony, of course, involves calling out that which is not of God and speaking about what will be. But at its root, all Christians are prophets insofar as they testify to the work of God in the world. To see the dynamics of the prophetic in this sense, one can still do much worse than look to the discussion that occupies the first half of Congar's early true and false reform in the church. Theology is also speculative. I used the Latin term speculatio for a reason. In Latin, it carries the sense both of scrutiny, of examining and judging a reality that is before us, and the sense of looking out over a broad horizon. Speculation in the sense of an intellectual attempt to stretch established principles to new cases or to bring into theological orbit new questions and new the theoretical resources. The articulation and re-articulation necessary when one hands on, even using well-established terms and concepts, we'll see more of this tomorrow, shows that tradition and speculation are actually inseparable. Speculation in modern English has come to have a range of connotations that I think name a rather different set of intellectual operations. And we'll have cause to think about this tomorrow when we turn directly to the question of how newness enters the theological world. But there is also a speculation that is part of the invitation God extends to us. To restore and exercise human reason, we are invited to think with, in, and through the word that has been spoken among us. Through meditation on this word, we may, with grace and in time, come to see more of the created order, both in glory and, for now, in tragedy. The unified act of traditio and speculatio 
has different aspects, of course, shaped by the manner in which different resources for thought and different contexts intervene. Most obviously in our day, and in the context of theological thinking, when it is practiced in universities or trained by universities, the act may be focused on biblical texts or on resources from the tradition or with particular philosophical questions in mind to give just a few examples. But a great deal is lost when these different aspects are not perceived as part of a unified conversation as aimed at the same goal and as aimed at the handing on the same faith. From another perspective, one might say that a great deal is lost when these different aspects are not understood as actions within the symbolic world of the body of Christ as it heads towards union with the Father. An extra level of difficulty exists here because the conversation which constitutes the theological act of necessity occurs amid and is nurtured by a wide variety of other secular conversations that have little interest in and often only animosity towards the Christian tradition. These secular conversations are thus both generative and seductive. It is the negotiation of the boundaries thus created, boundaries which might also be construed as debates over ends and over assumptions about the nature of the created order, that have caused so much of the controversy over the very nature of theology in the past few hundred years. If one construes the nature of theology in something like this fashion, then it becomes clear that theological thinking is rarely far from the need to think about Christ's person in human and in Trinitarian perspective. There is a dogmatic foundation on which theological thinking rests. It is important, I think, for this to be stated frequently, because around this task in the modern theological world, many other tasks and concerns have come to circle, some of necessity, some falsely, most partaking of some truth, but some only naked emperors. What I have sketched so far makes theology seem, I think, too constructive, too easy a mode, perhaps, of tradition reasoning. One more topic must be broached. A few years ago, I was asked to take part in a seminar on the intriguing question, what do the saints know? While there are many ways in which I might have answered this question, I ultimately suggested that one of the most important things that saints have, whether theologians or not, is a well-honed attention to the disruption that the gospel affects to our reasoning and to our imagining of the world. By disruption, I prefer to the manner in which, first, the language of the Christian faith, its fount of images and narratives, generates particular avenues of thought that cut across those that may have been common currency in a particular culture or in a particular life. But second, I also refer to the way that this generative force is also a binding one, restricting, rejecting, and often interrupting paths of thought and imagination that otherwise might have seemed attractive, rational, or just simply obvious. I hope that my use of the word imagination here gives a sense of the sheer range of ways in which the gospel generatively and bindingly disrupts. Through the Spirit's work, this disruption happens in and is modeled for us by those of many intellectual gifts and by those with few. The direct and persevering faith of the parishioner who attends daily mass, believes in the word of the liturgy played out before him or her, exemplifies the disruption of the gospel every bit as much as the philosopher who confesses Christ and abandons the patterns of reason that seem hallowed by tradition, say an origin or an Edith Stein, or every bit as much as the dramatic decision of one who sells all and heads off for the desert. Each of these exemplifies the generative and binding disruption that the gospel causes in the fallen world, and each offers lessons for the theologian about the brute an inescapable reality of the terms, commands, and images through which the word has been spoken to us. And at the very heart of that generative and binding disruption 
is the continual nurturing symbolic field through which we speak of, worship and touch the humanity of Christ. The development of attention to ways in which this field generates and disrupts is essential if we are to avoid the seductions of entering without theological critique into the secular conversations that are also essential nurturing features of the Christian tradition. This disruption occurs in aid of the mind's reformation. And this leads to one of the perennial ironies of Christian attempts to develop in knowledge of God. These last few sentences put in rather flowery language, a point that is, I think, of immense import for the theologian. The fundamental language of Christian faith and belief, the Christian symbolic universe, is not, should not be something that the theologian seeks to transcend. We may seek to offer probably or possible interpretation. We may seek to render something plausible or comprehensible, but still we must sit with and within a symbolic universe constituted by a reordering of Israel's scriptures in the light of Christ. Faith remains mis faith and mystery remains mystery. Okay, so far I've sketched out a little about the nature of theology. There is enough there, I hope, to give you a basic sense of my assumptions and to cause a little annoyance. Some of the points I have made, we will come back to at a number of points today. But my main focus today is going to be to show that if something like what I have offered is so, then theology is consequently best understood as an exercise in curation. When we understand it to be so, then suddenly a series of problems and consequences will appear. But to get there, we must take a short detour, thinking for a while about the nature of theology's complex relationship to philology. We must do this because theological thinking has, since at least the second century, found itself interwoven with the philological tradition. Nietzsche famously described a philologist as one who teaches reading slowly. What he means is equally famously open to question. His definition certainly draws on his own classical training and the term seems intended primarily to convey something about how his readers should respect the enigmatic character of his own aphoristic texts. Nevertheless, the notion of reading slowly may serve as a useful point of departure, as a frame within which more technical definitions must find their place. The Indologist Sheldon Pollock defines philology, quote, as the discipline of making sense of texts. By this pithy phrase, he intends to name a practice that is found well beyond the European cultural frame and also a practice that underlies or is interwoven with a wide variety of modern humanities disciplines. His argument in this latter respect is paralleled in James Turner's recent sweeping volume, Philology, the Forgotten Origins of the Modern Humanities, well worth a summer read. Expanding on Pollock's definition just a little, I would like to define philology as the art of clarifying, historicizing, and curating texts, and doing so in such a way as to suspend texts between their readers and the time or times of their production. In arguing this, I am locating myself with those who resist the restriction of the term philology just to the editing and preparation of texts. Now I do so because I see philology as inevitably intertwined with and inseparable from a much broader set of intellectual activities focused on texts, even if the result is awarding philology great reach and unclear boundaries. So I'm happy to situate myself in the quite diverse tradition of those who follow Nietzsche in thinking of philology as a form of reading slowly. For the purposes of the argument that follows, it may be helpful to imagine an inner and an outer ring of activities constituting philology. The inner ring consists of the tasks of editing texts and offering close commentary on those texts. The outer ring 
consists in the work of interpretation that may move far away from those texts before circling back. It consists in the work of arguing for those texts, articulating why they are the objects of study. In this outer ring, we might also think to place the activity of relating one text to others, whether contemporaneous or long pre or post dating. But of course, this work is also central to the inner ring, as in the case of an editor who suspects interpolation and amends the text in the light of knowing deeply the idioms of other contemporary texts. Or in the case of a commentator who interprets by drawing links to statements in contemporary material. In both the inner and the outer ring of philology, some of this work is explicit, but much remains implicit. Allow me to say a little, each about clarifying, historicizing and curating. Philology clarifies by establishing texts, by identifying references in texts, by highlighting ambiguities and suggesting their possible interpretation. We also clarify by understanding and interpreting the flow of arguments in texts and thus clarifying inevitably bleeds into historicizing. From antiquity to the present, one of the most important features of philology has been opening up of distance between text and interpreter, and then the subsequent negotiating or attempted erasure of that distance. Now, the activities of distancing and then negotiating distance have, of course, taken on particular casts in modernity that more or less consciously increase the felt distance between text and commentator. And I'll have much more to say about this tomorrow. It is frequently noted that one of the most decisive shifts in post-Renaissance traditions of philology is the growth of what we might term the reconstructive. Reconstructive here denotes the attempt to construct questions, debates, and cultural contexts that underlie particular documents. While such reconstruction has always been a possibility in some form for the philological enterprise, the past four centuries have seen this undertaken in an increasingly conscious attempt to put center stage the jarring strangeness of another era. Concurrently, the development of these emphases in historiography has also given rise to both romantic and post-romantic attempts to bridge the gap that philology has created, and then to more recent attempts to reflect on the production of the gap as a goal in itself. So far, I've spoken only about clarifying and historicizing. But even at this point, we should note that the adaptation to Christian ends of ancient scholarly culture was simply intrinsic to the emergence and development of Christian intellectual life. This is clearly so when we speak of the development of Christian exegesis in the early church. But remember that philological techniques remain central to Christian thinking, not only because of scripture's centrality, but also because of the increasing centrality of authoritative secondary texts by other Christian writers beginning in the late fourth century. In the first case, at the roots of emergent conceptions of intellectual expertise in the second century was an engagement with Hellenistic philology, the techniques used by grammarians, rhetoricians, historians, logicians, and philosophers. The shape of Christian exegesis, and thus the very character of Christian argument is deeply indebted to ancient philological tradition. Christian intellectuals from Papias at the turn of the second century through to the great Christian historical tradition, beginning with Eusebius at the beginning of the fourth century, use the techniques of the historian in their attempts to lay out the story of the church. In the second case, the gradual rise of appeals to and negotiation of named authorities from the fourth century on involved the application to new materials of techniques already central to Christian intellectual life. With reference to the subsequent history of Christian thought, it would not take much to show the continuities between such diverse phenomena as monastic commentary on scripture, scholastic use of authorities, 
and the emergence of what was called positive or historical theology in the late 15th century. However much Christian theology is a matter of responding to the Spirit's work among us, however much this involves surprising shifts as we are drawn again to the roots of, faith, of our faith, Christian theology is an intrinsically philological enterprise. Christian thought's adaptation of the philological tradition should not, however, simply be understood as an adoption of techniques or the adoption of a fully formed philosophy of texts. As Christians adopted the philological, the philological was also adapted. And gradually, I think we may speak of Christian philological emphases and assumptions within this venerable tradition. There are, for example, many things quite distinctive about the status accorded the text of scripture in Christian thought. One might draw attention, for example, to the distinctive manner in which mainstream Christian thinkers after the second century framed their exegesis and their arguments within an insistence the scriptural texts could refer to the transcendent divine who enfolded all things, but that no higher level of reverence was possible. The story of Israel's God and of God's action in Christ could not be decoded as reflecting other hidden muthos. One might also note, for example, that Christian authors develop a distinctive attitude to places where the letter of scripture is taken to speak of the divine in ways that are true and yet beyond our comprehension, such as, to give a famous example, the distinction between the terms begotten and created. It's true, but we don't understand what it means. There are also quite distinctively Christian tensions in intellectual culture between the expert use of philology and the accepted power of explanations that stem from reading a text in the spirit. One might also explore how particular Christian theological commitments to revelation as both a revealing and a hiding, as an enlightening and a humbling of the intellect, have at times shaped appreciation for the slowness intrinsic to exegetical work. There's a great deal more that could be said about each of these examples, but I hope this is enough at least to indicate the importance of discussing how Christian use of the philological involved the creation of a distinctive strain within that broader tradition. Now, alongside clarifying and historicizing, I used the term curating. The activity of curating in its own right has been the subject of considerable discussion in recent decades. Originally, the term meant to look after or preserve. More recently, the term has taken on the connotations of selecting, organizing and arranging items for our engagement with them. Writers about the phenomenon of curation have also come to emphasize that in its relentless creation of connections to curate is to articulate conceptions of the world and its history. Hans Ulrich Obrist writes, for example, quote, curating at its most basic is simply connecting cultures, bringing the elements of different cultures into proximity with each other. The task of curating is to make junctions, to allow different elements to touch. You might describe it as the attempted pollination of culture or a form of map making that opens new routes through a city, a people or a world." Unquote. For Obrist, this work of connection is not conceived as creating links between cultures that remain unchanged, but about creating what he calls temporary communities through those relationships. Now, commenting on curation within the space of a gallery or a museum, it is not surprising that Obrist emphasizes their temporary nature. In a theological context, I think we would have to offer a somewhat different assessment emphasizing that curation is a key factor in forming the community of the church over time. Perhaps most visibly so in the liturgy's curation of Israel's texts, so as to form the church's perception of its true history and nature. Recent work on curation 
is also deeply attentive to the reality that those who curate do not exist in a neutral space. The construction and ordering of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford or the Field Museum in Chicago was part and parcel of particular imperialist modes of ordering knowledge and attempts to reorder both institutions are dependent on the complexities of our current post-imperialist angst. The curator thus interjects herself as an authority and must consider both the extent to which that interjection should be visible and named and the goals and context of such an interjection. To curate is thus always to exercise particular forms of attention and desire. And this can be done well only by considering one's place as an interpreter and a guardian of that which one curates. Now turning back from this wider discussion of curation to philology, how does the philologist in the broad sense I've used the term curate? Well, the philologist is always a preserver and arranger of knowledge, as well as a creator of relationships between text and reader. The philologist also shapes and models for a community notions of authority, modeling the sorts of care that texts deserve, modeling for the community what it means to have texts, what it means for texts to have authority, how to treat texts that have authority and which texts possess authority. This is true of those practicing the inner ring of philology where the mere choice of texts for editing and commentary constitutes an act of curation, as it is for those practicing the outsourcing tasks. Whether she knows it or not, the philologist plays a role in the preservation and definition of cultural forms. If we now ask ourselves how Christian theologians should imagine themselves as curating the Christian tradition, one of the most important questions we must ask is reflexive. How is it that Christian theologians in all our current subdivisions implicitly curate? An astringency in recognizing how central an activity curation is to all theological subdisciplines should make clear the importance of conceptualizing theology with some care. One of the most significant ways in which theologians curate is through including major figures from the past in narratives which then shape options supposedly available for consideration in the present. These narratives may both hold up for continued remembrance particular figures and attempt to curate how those figures should be understood as sources. At the same time, the very assumptions that theologians make about what it means to offer a narrative or merely to incorporate figures from the tradition into contemporary discourse are assumptions that become acts of curation, letting the reader know that an author is accorded a particular sort of authority as an ecclesially warranted model or presented as only ever provisional over against the plain sense of scripture or as necessarily needing supplementation or reconfiguration because of some feature of modernity. This is only to list a, a few easily grasped styles of presentation. There are many styles of implicit curation present within our different theological traditions. Our implicit curation of the past is also deeply shaped by the particular disciplinary and academic cultures within which we find ourselves. Many of our modern assumptions about the manner in which theological activities are divided between theological subdisciplines affect unhelpful divisions of philological work. The current relationship between the disciplines of historical theology or biblical studies on the one hand and systematic theology on the other instantiates a pernicious relationship between what I have termed the inner and the outer ring of the philological. It is far too easy for systematic theologians in a wide range of different Christian traditions to assume that the work of establishing texts, historicizing texts, commenting on texts, working out which text should be known and in what way is the work of a different beast called the historical theologian. 
Consequently, few theologians who understand themselves as systematic understand curation of the texts in the Christian tradition to be an intrinsic part of their task. And yet such theologians unavoidably undertake forms of curation. Those who study the history of theology may also be convicted, I think, of a general failure to meditate sufficiently on the theological presuppositions found within their own often implicit visions of the historical and of, fa of a failure to imagine themselves as also primary actors in the articulation of doctrine for the church. Progress from this impasse would involve us in thinking clearly about what theological disciplines there should actually be and how their tasks should interrelate. But before we can think about these questions directly, we need, I suggest, to spend a little more time thinking about the character of theological curation. I would like to do so by considering how it is that we should view the character of Christian beliefs and key moments in Christian thought. In order to do so, I promise to turn soon to some unnecessarily fancy French theory. But before I do that, I want to take just a minute to summarize two other arguments that I have recently offered. Doing so will help to make clear why I find this particular theoretical reflection helpful, or at least suggestive. A few years ago, I suggested in the Thomist that we view dogmatic definitions as not only authoritative statements of key Christian beliefs, but as also memorializing recollections of the circumstances and disputes that gave them birth. Thus, for example, Trinitarian dogma should be conceived not only as a series of propositions about the divine life and activity, but also as a calling to our attention of the Trinitarian controversies as a primary area for contemplation when we seek to understand Trinitarian belief. In this sense, theological curation of that time and of those decisions may and should also be recognized as an intrinsically speculative enterprise that should be continually before the eyes of theologians. In a second paper published in 2020, following in fact an excellent 2016 conference jointly organized by Princeton Seminary and the Dominican House of Studies in DC, I explored ways in which we might cast the act of tradition as sacramental, following hints in the work of Yves Congar. The Council's ecclesiological text Lumen Gentium was noteworthy for speaking of the church as the universal sacrament of salvation, a theme that was intended to provide a context for discussion of particular sacraments. Reflection on this theme had grown since the early 19th century, and it provided a means of linking sacramental acts within the church to a vision of the church itself as a unified body through which Christ acts in the world. But this theme also allows us now to reflect on particular constitutive acts as part of this broader sacramental reality, even if they do not have the guarantee of effectiveness that attends upon the defined sacraments of the church. And thus I argued that the act of traditio, the act of passing on the faith, is both the primary theological act and one that may be read as sacramental, as an effective sign of the restoration of the mind in Christ. The history of reflection on revelation in the church, which has taken form as a body of literary texts, may then be read as a history of responses to divine action, providing us both with a series of statements about the divine life, some of which receive a guarantee of adequacy and more broadly with a series of orientations that may school us in appropriate recognition of and response to the divine presence and action. Given the arguments of those two papers, what are we looking at when we undertake theological curation? The magnum opus of the French Jewish historian Pierre Noir focuses around the notion of lieu de mémoire, sites or realms of memory. Nora's focus 
has been to set out a new way of writing a national history. Studying the key sites of memory that have served as vehicles for articulating what it is to be French. Studying these sites involves theorizing the difference between investigating a historical event and investigating the symbolic reality that an event becomes. An individual site of memory he defines in this way. Quote, a lieu de mémoire is any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of a community. His three volumes then entitled Lieu de Mémoire constitute, he says, a project designed to create a topology of French symbolism. For Nora, the construction of Lieu de Mémoire by a society follows on the loss of what he termed real memory, the kind of inviolate social memory that primitive and archaic societies embody, he says. This is lost in the acceleration of history, as he puts it. Nora assumes that a lieu de mémoire is a consequence of modern historiography's nervous concern to give us true history, to grasp and objectify what has happened. As he puts it, if history did not seize upon memories in order to distort and transform them, to mold them or turn them into stone, they would not turn into lieu de mémoire which is to emerge in two stages. Moments of history are plucked out of the flow of history and then return to it, no longer quite alive, not yet entirely dead, like shells left on the shore when the sea of living memory has receded. Now, my interest here is not in teasing out the details of Nora's Gallic flourish or his concern about whether shells are in fact alive or not, and so I will not attempt further direct commentary on his project, but turn to its usefulness. Christian dogmas may themselves perhaps be considered as lieux de mémoire, as sites related both to the moments of their genesis and sites which sit at the center of webs of association, opening onto the histories of their interpretation. In this sense, to understand a dogma well, to see its depths and promise involves understanding both its genesis and understanding something of the history of its reception. Indeed, we are not only concerned here with understanding defined dogmas. The notion of lieu de mémoire also helps us to think about a wider set of figures, liturgies and practices in Christian thought that have been gradually invested with symbolic depth and resonance for the Christian imagination. Obviously enough, even beginning to explore Nora's conception in a theological context will involve us in refusing his philosophy of history. A Christian theology of salvation commits theologians not only to the reality that the word became incarnate at a particular point in history, but also that the reading and interpreting of the history of God's people in Israel and then also in the church provides a fundamental reference point for theological reflection. Indeed, the lifting out of the flow of events and people that they may be examined from many angles is even, one might argue, key to the process by which our fallen gaze comes to recognize its own failings. With reference to the definitional moments of the church's history, the raising up of particular sites as lieu de mémoire is not to render them lifeless, but a process of learning to see them as the actions both of human members of Christ's body and of its divine head. And thus, we have to refuse Nora's relationship of the view of the relationship between the symbolic and reality, as well as his romanticism concerning what it is to be truly immersed in the flow of history. Whatever the problems with this concept in its original formulation, I think it does help us better conceive the theologian's task as one of curation. While not every theologian can or should be a philologist in all senses, every theologian should understand their work to be partly an exercise in curation, which partly means seeing the continual clarifying and historicizing 
of central texts and statements as at the very heart of the continual grasping of Christian beliefs dogmatic core. Philological slowness and reverence are thus essential components of theological practice if increasing knowledge of the lieu de mémoire is understood to be at the very heart of Christian thinking. Perhaps also conceiving the matter thus can help us imagine the character of and interrelationship between different theological tasks. Those different tasks are in part related because they converge on the task of articulating and passing on both what has been revealed and the manner in which the divine head has led the body to interpret that revelation. Perhaps then, one of the most important aspects of an education in Christian doctrine should be the creation of a topology for the imagination through teaching how one should attend to significant lieu de memoir and how one should at the same time see such attention as also a formation in Christian belief itself. Where have we now arrived? I have tried to sketch some key elements in an account of Christian thought that takes seriously the fact that, in the terms of the young Ratzinger, the tradition of the church offers us the word's own constitutive answer to the word spoken among us. That tradition is a messy affair full of unpleasant characters, subjecting their opponents to vitriolic mischaracterization, to often amazingly sustained feats of misrepresentation, and on occasion to sheer violence. But at the same time, it is a history through which the word speaking among us has come to be understood, and the mystery of God's action in Christ offered to us. If we are to take this view of tradition seriously, then I suggest we need to develop an account of theology as primarily an act of handing on as an act of tradition. We will be able to do so, I suggest, by reflecting anew on Christian thought's long engagement with the philological tradition. Recent discussions of curation enable us to press the persistent importance of curation within the philological, and consequently I hope it becomes possible to see a little more clearly what sort of obligation rests upon the theologian who seeks to appropriately curate. Now, one important sleight of hand involved here is that I've assumed that theologians should adapt to their use a number of key features from post-Renaissance developments in, his, in philology, just as they did in the antique context. This sleight of hand I will attempt to remedy to some extent tomorrow. But if I am right, then the notion of curation offers us a rather fruitful way to think through ways in which the Catholic theologian can take seriously modern forms of historical consciousness. However, while all this might seem rather positive in tone, if we were to pursue this conception of the theological task further, then we would very soon come up against significant resistance. Why? Well, in the first place, Pursuing such a line of inquiry pushes against the importance of subdisciplinary boundaries in theology today. Those boundaries are inculcated in younger thinkers by, form, by our forms of graduate education. They are reinforced by the manner in which hiring committees consciously and unconsciously police them. Students come to perceive them rather quickly through curricular structures. Yes, yes. There are many of us today who rail against these distinctions in different ways, and perhaps especially against the barrier between biblical studies and theology. But those barriers have not really come down. And in mainstream Protestant and Catholic faculties and departments of theology, they seem to me to be policed as vigorously as ever. These subdisciplinary barriers have arisen for many reasons. But Catholic theologians especially, I think, have subjected themselves to them with remarkably little clear theological reflection on their structure. In the long history of theological thought, these subdisciplinary boundaries are relatively new. Whether and how they should be retained is a question necessary if we are to take seriously theology as focused around the task of curation. In the second place, 
pursuing my line of inquiry will push us to think hard about the character of a theologically informed attention to history and to the created order, and thus would bring us into conflict with some important aspects of discourse within the humanities. We will, and indeed should, find ourselves both inescapably related to the tradition of philology and the humanities, and yet questioning both as we adapt them, sorry, and yet questioning both as we adapt them to Christian theological ends. We will, in other words, find ourselves both part of and yet resisting some fairly persistent features of ideolo features and ideologies deeply embedded in the modern university. Ideologies about the nature of events, causality, and human action. Tomorrow, I hope to take this discussion forward first by thinking with McIntyre about what we owe to our dead. Second, by considering how we should conceive the relationship between historical and systematic theology. And third, by a return to the question of what it means for the theological curator also to be a participant in post-Renaissance modes of historiography. And fourth, and finally, by a nod to the question that all professing systematic theologians will want to ask me at this point. If it is as you say, how does newness enter the world? But that, as I say, is for tomorrow. For now, I think I've said enough.